Hello. I'm Brad Gerson, Executive Director of Atlantic Ventures. We want to welcome you to day three of the Atlantic Festival here on the gorgeous and historic wharf, our new home. We are very excited to have the great Atlantic senior editor Van R. Newkirk II lead a discussion with the filmmakers and subjects of Lowndes County and the road to black power. The documentary is inspired in part by Van's reporting and produced in association with The Atlantic. The film premiered at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival and will stream on Peacock in early 2023. As attendees of this event, you've received an exclusive digital screener. And if you have not watched it yet, you have 24 hours to do so. At the end of this conversation, we will open it up for an audience Q&A, so get your questions ready. A few quick practical notes. Please silence your cell phones, but don't put them away. When posting on social media, you can use the hashtag TAF22. We want you to be part of the conversation online. Now let's get started. Please welcome to the stage Jennifer Lawson, member of the SNCC Legacy Project, Hassan Jeffries, <laughs> Hassan Jeffries, associate, associate professor from The Ohio State University, <laughs> Catherine Coleman Flowers, founder, Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. And of course, Atlantic senior editor Van R. Newkirk II. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon to discuss this important film, Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power, which, uh, as you all know, as Brad just told you, will be streaming on Peacock early 2023. And if you haven't uh, checked out the digital screener in your email, Please, uh, when we finish this, take some time to do so. And if you have already seen it, go watch it again. <laughs> now, before we start talking, I want to show you all a clip from that film. Obviously, this, this looks at, the entire film looks at uh, a pivotal era, a pivotal time in the black freedom struggle. It chronicles the residents of Lowndes County, Alabama, and their efforts not just to become a part of the system, but to define their own democracy, define their destiny, and how SNCC, this organization, came in and became a critical partner for them in doing so. So this clip, we're, we're looking at a, Lowndes County was called Bloody Lowndes, and it was called so because of the intense violence that was leveraged against black residents. And so this clip, uh, which features Stokely Carmichael, uh, it's, it's indicative of the risk that these people were taking. And the first day that I was in the county registering voters and the sheriff put a gun to Stokely Carmichael's head and said, niggers, tonight you'll be in hell. Stokely said, and tonight hell will be integrated. That was it for me. I was in. But I come from this very sheltered environment and suddenly I'm face to face with all the genius crimes of white America. It was nothing to be riding down Highway 80 and suddenly a pickup truck of white men pull from the side of the road and start chasing us with their guns hanging out the window. And Stokely Carmichael would have to drive 90 miles an hour to make sure that they wouldn't kill us. I mean, fear is just going to immobilize you. You're dead already. So there's no fear here. I'd have to learn to drive effectively so that when they chase me, I'll be able to dodge them and they would have run into a truck or run into a ditch or leave them in the smoke. There was no fear here. It was just clever response. Survival instincts at its best. <laughs> the operative part, uh, somebody um, tells Stokely Carmichael that he's going to send him to hell. And Stokely says, then tonight hell will be integrated. <laughs> And I believe that is an appropriate way for us to begin this conversation. Now, I want to start with, with Catherine, because you are part of this film as sort of a, a second generation person who is involved in this struggle in Lowndes. 
And I want to know for you, knowing that your parents, that your forebears were involved in this long struggle, what does it mean to you to have a film out now about that inheritance for you? Well, I think that it is about time because there are so many people that have been inspired by the Lyons County movement. And I, I just remember um, there was a young man who went to, he was in Vienna, and he said that when he went to Vienna, there was a book there in, in the bookstore about Lyons County. And even with Ruby Sales, who's in the film, uh, I had always heard about Ruby Sales. And, and people, when I was a young activist, they always tried to say that I reminded them of her. And I met her uh, when she came to Lowndes County as part of the, the, uh, the commemoration around the death of Jonathan Daniels. And there were young people that were there from Palestine hmm. who said that they were inspired in Palestine by the struggle in Lowndes County. It is time for a movie to be made, and I'm glad that this movie is made and will be shown here and hopefully can inspire young people here in the United States. Now, you mentioned Ruby Sales. Ruby Sales was the woman who was in the beginning of the clip talking about Stokely. Um, just an actually wonderful human being and uh, a, such a powerful piece of this film. When, way back when, I think uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, I was talking to uh, Demma Paxson Fofong, who's a producer of this film and a part of Multitude Films, and they were trying to decide what we would use as the source material. And Hassan, obviously, <laughs> we decided we were going to go with Bloody Lounge. For you, you told me you've been waiting decades for this event to be made into a film. Now that it is, how do you feel? I feel cold, man. <laughs> <laughs> But I feel, but I, but it's a good cold. I feel good. Cold on the outside, but warm on the inside. Right? It's fall now. It's fall now. It's winter. Yeah. Uh, winter in DC. Uh, no, I feel, I feel good. I'm excited about it because it's a story that needed to be told. Right. Um, I was drawn to Lowndes County uh, because of what happened there, um, and and what the people did. A partnership of local people with SNCC activists who set out to give real meaning to democracy in America, and they did it. They achieved something unbelievable. Um, and it's a story that we should all know about. Um, and so you know, I spent the time doing research to write the book. Um, but now we have this powerful film that allows people, that breathes life into the words that were on, that were on a page and, and captured. Any, look, I was, a, I was a poor graduate student driving around in a Mitsubishi Mirage with no air conditioning in Alabama. So I couldn't, I couldn't get access to the wonderful video archives, right? I mean, which is part of the, what you can do um, when, you, when you're making a documentary film. And so there were clips in there of conversations and interviews that I had only imagined took place in my mind. Right? So just to see it come to life in that way was just was really phenomenal. Now, again, I, I really urge everyone to see this as soon as possible. I think there, there's so much footage that even people who have been studying this thing for, for years have never seen. Uh, there's a lot to engage with and digest. Uh, one thing, if you do watch it, that you will see is the term that we use uh, for that era, the civil rights movement, it's not used often in the film or in contemporaneous accounts. Jennifer, I want to talk to you. I want to ask you what it's called in the film is the freedom struggle. What do we lose when we change the definition of this thing to be narrowly about civil rights and not about what people in Lowndes County were fighting for, which was freedom? Uh, I am so thrilled that this film has been made. I, uh, and it's a very important film, I think. Uh, a film that's important because it really is about democracy in America. And it's about the work that ordinary people do. That it's not about superheroes, it's not about people coming from somewhere else 
to change a place, but it really, the real story is about the people of Lowndes County themselves. And that I, I'm so glad that their stories are going to be shared with people. And that that's where it's, when we talk about the civil rights movement, I think that through watching this film, you began to see that it's a movement for change and social justice. That no matter whether you label it civil rights or whether you label it Black Lives Matter or whatever, it's a continuity. It's a sense that people at some point say, enough, enough. I want change in my life. I don't want to live like this. And begin to set in motion activities that bring about that change. And so that's what's so wonderful to me that it tells the story of John Hewlett and Lillian McGill and so many other people who in Lowndes County, with the odds stacked so much against them, moved forward to make that change happen. Now, I don't think I've properly introduced your role in the film and what your relationship to Lowndes County is. Can you tell us more about that and what it, I guess, how it feels for you to see that, to see, to go back in time, sort of, and revisit that moment? Well, it's uh, quite fascinating because this starts for me as a, a college student at Tuskegee. That was my introduction to Lowndes County. And I worked on voter, on voter registration in Macon County, which was right around Tuskegee. But then we began to see, realize that this was not something particular to our college community. It was happening all across the South. It was happening all across our country. People were being denied the right to vote. I mean, one of the most amazing things about Lowndes County is that in 1960, with over 5,000 black people eligible to be registered, there was not a single registered voter. And so when they invited us to come in to help you know, Stokely, all of these uh, SNCC people, to come and help register people to vote, then as a student at Tuskegee, I thought, oh, well, I could do that on some weekends. <laughs> and so I then volunteered. And, and of course, it wouldn't surprise you that school began to fade away and that I began to spend more and more time in Lowndes County and that my most pivotal role, so I spent time there working with voter registration and helping to organize the community and what I would call community education because the film is not just about voting. It was one of the important questions was, what's the vote for? How will we use this vote to change our lives? And when people sort of said, well, it would be great if we didn't have a racist sheriff in this county who was brutalizing us. And then so when people would say, well, why don't you become the sheriff? People said, oh, I don't, we don't know what the job of the sheriff is. And so the role that I'm so proud of having played is helping to develop educational materials that would explain what the roles of the county officers were. And that I did the best that I could, so I made little stick figures. I drew things, and those became what we call now the Lowndes County Comics. <laughs> Very important part of the film, by the way. Now, Hassan, brother, you weren't lying. It's cold up here, man. <laughs> I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> we, I did introduce the idea, you know, that this was called Bloody Lounge, and we did talk about that in the clip. But I'm hoping you can help explain to us just how the system of power worked in this county uh, before this challenge to it, and how it was maybe emblematic of, of the Jim Crow Deep South. Well. Lowndes County is located in the Alabama Black Belt. And the Black Belt, of course, is a, a band of counties that's not just limited to Alabama, but stretches from the Tidewater, Virginia, all the way to Texas. Um, and this was old plantation. This is, this is the most fertile soil in, in America, in the region, for sure. Uh, so this was old plantation counties uh, and majority black counties. 
Uh, and so one of the things, we talk about how power operates, one of the things that doesn't happen in the black belt that we see happen in other places, other urban spaces, is you, you don't have white flight, right? Because white people don't abandon the land, right? So they're still there. So even though this is an 80% African American community, you know, 20% of the white folk are still there are controlling the vast majority of land, um, their complete control of the county courthouse, but the, the, co but, but, but the cornerstone, we, we think about the cornerstone of slavery was, was violence, was, was racial, that, that keeps the institution of slavery alive. That doesn't end when slavery ends. So the cornerstone of freedom, the cornerstone of the Jim Crow era is also violence. And that racial terror is paralyzing, right, because it's real. It's not, it's not a fiction. People are like, well, maybe if, if we, something happens, then you know, if we try this, we, no, no, no. If you were in Lowndes County and you attempted to register to vote, you would be killed. If you attempted to challenge the, the landowners in 1935, there's a sharecropper strike. They just wanted a dollar a day wage and dozens get killed. And so that has a chilling effect on what people are willing to do. Now, when the time we get to ninth, so, so the power is maintained through violence and racial terror. That's a part of the sort of the American story we don't want to talk about. You know, we pretend as though the political violence we saw on January 6th was somehow an anomaly. How the hell do you think we started this experiment in the first place? That's what the American Revolution was, right? Political violence. And that political violence carried through through the civil rights era. It did not disappear. And this is the last thing. I got to keep talking, otherwise I'll really get cold. This, <laughs> is that the political violence, it was still dangerous. So when the first group of African Americans attempt to register to vote, a group of 39, and they show up in the beginning of 1965, it's still dangerous. I mean, they're still risking their lives. The question that I had going in was, well, why did you, like, what changed? And I'll never forget when John Hewlett, one of the leaders of the movement, he said, well, by that time, this is a decade after Montgomery, Selma, Selma movement has is, 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 is already started to kick up, so we've had some real, real movement. And he said, well, we knew that if we attempted to register the vote, that they wouldn't kill us that night. We were still in danger, but they wouldn't come get us that night. Like, I thought I was tough from New York, but I was like, that ain't, that ain't much different. That's not really helping me out here, right? Like if I'm like, yo, you got another day. But that space, just that window that they would not be killed immediately, right, was enough not only to give them a little bit more room and space to, to, to engage in activism, but to encourage others, right? So it's still dangerous throughout this whole movement. It's still dangerous. We can't forget that. White folks, Southern, Southerners don't wake up and be like, oh, okay, we ain't know y'all wanted to vote. Oh, come on. Like that never happens. <laughs> but they do it anyway, and I think that's a critical part of the story as well. Now, I want to remind you all, we will be doing uh, audience Q&A at the end of this session, so uh, hopefully you all are, have some questions percolating in your minds, and uh, you can brave the wind enough to go up to the microphone soon. Catherine, one part of the film that I think is really uh, interesting to me, and I'm trying to show it to my, my son who's five, yeah, you know, <laughs> but the thing that I think is hopefully going to resonate with him the most is you talk a lot about in that film growing up seeing people who are claiming this birthright for themselves who are making their own reality how did that affect your sense of possibility growing up well I think that when I look back and look back at that time and the work that I do currently uh, it had everything to do with it. It had everything to do with the fact that I grew up in a household where my parents were activists. It had everything to do with the fact that they would come home and talk about different kinds of things around movement. Uh, it has everything to do with how I organize currently. And I feel that we should, one of the things I learned from SNCC is that you don't just mobilize people, you have to organize them. That's not showing up, having an event, taking pictures and leaving. Uh, also, a lot of the principles that I learned from being around people that were involved with SNCC is the movement and the way they move and organize is very different. 
And, and a lot of those principles, although they don't give SNCC credit for it, we see them in the principles of the environmental justice movement. Because one of the first things in the environmental justice movement is that the people that are residents have to be at the table from the very beginning. And SNCC enacted that. And that was what it was about. So I see a lot of uh, my, my work, and even I think Hassan mentioned Black Lives Matter. Everything that I'm seeing happening now resonates from that. And I think I was just fortunate. I feel like, you know, you know, I'm from the South, so I have to come from a Christian tradition. But in the Christian tradition, one of the things they talked about when I went to Sunday school, and, and also I want to note that a lot of, in the movie, you're going to see a lot of churches. The churches were very much a part of the movie. That's where people met and organized and even voted in some cases. But I remember, I felt like, you know, one of the stories from, that I remember from Sunday school is how Jesus was sitting with the, the scribes in the temple. And I felt like I was sitting with the scribes in Lowndes County. Wow. I want to stick with that for uh, just a moment. <laughs> because I, I know you, I've known you for years now because I report on environmental justice and voting rights. And when people ask me why those two things, it's kind of hard for me to explain that I believe they are one thing. That it's not two separate interests of mine or two separate beats. I don't think you can talk about one without the other. But I think you do a much better job of explaining that than I can. Can you tell us more about your work in EJ and how you connect those two? Well, the way I connect those two is that a lot of the areas that are suffering from environmental injustice, where, whether it means locating uh, dirty plants there, or in the case of Lyons County, the funding that comes to the state has never gotten to the county to deal with sanitation issues. I think that it is uh, a type of benign neglect. And I think if we were to look at the history of all of these areas, and we were to look at those issues, those areas that have struggled for a very long time, especially those areas in the Black Belt that Hassan just laid out, we would find that that's where we would see the dirty plants. Those are the most polluted areas probably in the United States, or the lack of investment, which I think is an extension of what would happen when communities organize for the right to vote and organize for civil rights. There was a type of benign neglect that I think has extended through the lack of investment, the lack of making sure people have proper infrastructure. Look at Jackson, Mississippi, right now. You know, that's another extension of that. I just remember being in Jackson with some of the people, because in the film it goes back and forth between Lowndes County and Mississippi. And, and there is a, a deep relationship in how they impacted each other and the organizing that was going on. And I just remember uh, they, when they were celebrating the Congressional Challenge in Mississippi and Jackson and standing in the governor's mansion and people from SNCC were crying because they never thought that they would be standing in the, in the, in the governor's mansion singing freedom songs in Mississippi. And here we are, we come full circle. We're right back there again. So I think that as it relates to environmental justice, we will see that these issues are interrelated. They are civil rights issues. And I could go on to say that I'm leaving here today to go to North Carolina because the EPA administrator is going to be announcing in North Carolina an office of civil rights and environmental justice that's going to be organized on a federal level where the person who would head it would be a presidential appointee confirmed by the Senate. I think that's the best way I can explain the intersectionality there or the fact that they're one and the same. The last thing I need to mention, Van, is that the DOJ uh, has also launched, uh, the Department of Justice has, has launched uh, investigations into civil rights violations around environmental justice. And the very first investigation that they launched was in Lowndes County. Wow. Well, that thing tomorrow, Warren County. That's where I'm from. <laughs> Jennifer, I think for people who haven't yet seen the film, who don't, aren't two feet into the history, it might do for us to take a step back. Because I think Catherine just mentioned the work of SNCC, how those praxis and principles became uh, embedded in other movements. I want to know more about, I think it's, it's easy to forget that the people we're looking at in the film are young people. That everybody there is pretty young, younger than I am now. I'm not that young anymore. Uh, but looking at, uh, can you just help us explain 
what SNCC was trying to accomplish and how it got to Lowndes County. Certainly, I'd be happy to. And SNCC stands for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And the organization that named the Coordinating Committee came about when Ella Baker, Miss Ella Baker, who was working with the NAACP in 1960, she saw that students were spontaneously staging sit-ins and marches all around the country, and she thought it would be great to bring them together so that they could talk with each other and meet and coordinate their activities. That meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina at Shaw University was then the foundation. That was the founding moment of SNCC. A number of young people from all over the country, primarily though from the HBCUs from Howard and other places, came together <clears throat> and started working to, with demonstrations, marches, sit-ins, and usually Practically everybody in the organization was younger than 25. I mean, the people like Jim Foreman, who was in his 20s, was an old timer, Bob Moses. Those were the older people. Majority of us, some of us were 17, 18 years old. And one of the, SNCC was the only youth-led civil rights group. So in contrast to Martin Luther King and the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Council and other groups, SNCC was the only one that was led by young people like that. And one of the, <clears throat> what was one, SNCC was quite striking in that it was a learning organization. I mean, it was one where there was, it was fueled by the curiosity of these young people. And so it wasn't that, ah, we are leaders and we have answers. No, it was much more a, what's the problem? And let's now all look at this together and let's as a community come to find a solution. So it was constantly learning and learning from the community. I mean, some terms that come into, uh, that are re often used when referring to SNCC is that it was about organizing from the inside out and it was about doing things from the bottom up. So it meant that it wasn't some, uh, an idea that you were parachuting in to help the poor people out there. No, you needed to come in with the attitude that you are one of the people, that you are a part of this and that the problems that we are facing, we're facing together. There's no us and them in that sense. So SNCC was very, very different in that respect. And so we were constantly learning from the communities in which we organized. And the people, I mean, we have, uh, to this day, people quote some of the people who we met along the way, like the Jackson family in Lowndes County. There, could have, there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement were it not for the strength of some of the families there who said, well, I know they're gonna fire me from my job, they're gonna start shooting us in a few days and everything, but you folks are welcome to stay over here and I'm gonna go and pull out my shotgun because we're gonna protect you too. While you stay here, we're gonna protect you. So if you come down this road and you see a car and it doesn't look like it's a truck or something that we haven't seen, let us know because it's time to get the guns out then. We have to protect ourselves. And that was a spirit in Lowndes County that was just incredible. But SNCC then really looked at these communities and for all the communities, whether it was Southwest Georgia or Mississippi, where we worked, it was much more a spirit of what is it that's the issue here within the community, and then what our organizing, how can our organizing help in working with that community? You mentioned uh, the role of Ella Baker, and I think one of the maybe just absolutely stunning part of the film is the quote she gives about how strong people don't need strong leaders. Can you? Tell us more about how that's an animating philosophy and, and, and how, I think, again, if you watch the film, you'll see that it 
has to be different than lots of other civil rights documentaries because it's not driven by the great leader or an examination of the great man. Can you tell us how those things, how this concept of a strong people not needing leaders, it, 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 it's animated in the film and how it's still alive today? Well, I think that it's, it, it's reflected today in the work of Catherine Flowers and the others in organizations like hers where people are continuing to work. And it, uh, when Catherine, I have just a quick aside, when Catherine was talking about environmental justice, I couldn't help but think about the fact that right here where we're sitting is very related to that issue of environmental justice. Because this part of Washington, D.C. used to be a black community and was destroyed to, for urban renewal, which is a major issue throughout this country in terms of environmental justice. So in the same way that there are places that have been where black communities have been and other communities of color have been poisoned by uh, munitions dumps and other chemicals being placed there. There are also places that have been just totally destroyed. Some of the wealthiest black communities in this country have been destroyed through the process of what was called urban renewal, where then freeways were put through stadiums in Pittsburgh. Stadiums were built in the place where prominent communities existed. So sorry for that little aside, but I couldn't oh, help no, it. Oh no, it's good, it's, it's good. I used to come out here and get crab legs. Here. It's right here around, all around us. <laughs> but, but I think the, when Ella Baker's, uh, and, and Ella Baker had a profound impact on all of us, on our generation, and that her notion of strong people don't need strong leaders was something that uh, was a part of the ethos of SNCC. And, and it, was, it was also something that I think uh, helped SNCC be an organization where sometimes people will ask, what about women in the civil rights movement? And that I feel that SNCC was filled with strong and powerful women. And one reason for that was that notion that we are our own leaders and that we all are responsible for the change that we want to see and that we have to make that change. We shouldn't wait for someone to come down from a mountain or someplace to then to give us direction. We need to find the direction that we need. So I think that that's something that Ella Baker really helped deliver to us in a very concrete way. Hassan, Catherine mentioned that this film does not stay just in Lowndes County. A very important part of the film is uh, the 1966 March Against Fear, where Stokely Carmichael delivers uh, what is now emblematically known as the Black Power Speech in Greenville, Mississippi, where my mom was born. But um, <laughs> can you, uh, I think, in their traditional histories of the movement, of civil rights, black power is often cast as a boogeyman, as the foil for more well-known nonviolent constructs. Can you tell us more about what the actual role of black power was in this moment and what it was speaking to? I think one of the things that's uh, so powerful about um, the movement that happens in Lowndes County and that's captured so wonderfully in the film uh, is that it, it, it breaks several uh, normative narratives about what the civil rights movement of black freedom struggle was. For one, the movement in Lowndes doesn't begin until 1965, right? And, and it continues after. So it begins right before about the drop of the Voting Rights Act and continues after the Voting Rights Act. So chronologically, it actually fits outside of what we conventionally think of as a civil rights movement. Because we think, for example, that you know, the movement was just about securing access to the ballot. Well, what happens once you have the ballot in your hand? And that was a critical question that was asked by SNCC activists of folk in Lowndes County. Now that you have the vote, what are you going to do with it? And their decision was, we're going to create our own independent political party. Right? I mean, that's, you're going to do what? And how are we going to do it? Right? Um, you're not just going to roll into you know, traditional democratic politics. And that is so 
that really speaks to the heart of what black power was. Uh, because it wasn't just about gaining access. We, we, we often define the civil rights movement by black proximity to whiteness. And this wasn't about that, right? We, we get so obsessed you know, with school integration. Like black people, you know, like just wanted to send little black kids to, to school with little white kids because somehow little white kids are magical. I teach a lot of little white kids, they ain't that magical. <laughs> but they do have a remarkable ability to attract tax dollars with them, right? So black power was about gaining access to the lever, levers of power so that people in the tradition of Ella Baker could be able to make the decisions that impacted and affected their lives. And in a very concrete way, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture articulates He's like, by black power, we mean just simply in those places where African Americans are a majority, that they're able to create political entities to exercise, to, to give voice to their um, concerns. Uh, and in those places where they are a numerical majority, m minority, they can enter into coalition from a position of strength. That's it. Ain't nothing about hating white people and all this other silliness. Right? It's about power. Unfortunately, uh, when white folk heard it and they heard power, they only perceived power through the lens of them exercising power, which had always been through force and violence. And so the association of black and power scared the heck out of white folk, when in reality, it was just simply saying, we want a seat at the table on our own terms. We want self-determination. We're going to fight back against this white supremacy. And if we have to do it, through force of arms, well, then we got to do it through force of arms. We're going to defend ourselves. So when you put all of that together, then you get this narrative about the movement that sets up sort of civil rights, Martin Luther King, um, good, black power, bad. All black power was was saying, listen, we're going to do this on our own terms. Now, I want to remind you all that we will be doing audience Q&A in just a few moments, but I want to offer the last word of my questions uh, to Catherine and Jennifer. Uh, you all, this has been a part of your lives. You're seeing events that you are, you are part of, that you already know, people who you already know. I want to ask, especially as a way for, uh, I guess, helping lay out the film to people who haven't seen it, is there anything there that surprised you? I'll start with Catherine. <laughs> Was there anything in the film that surprised me? Uh, I think actually seeing the conversations and the, the, the type of research that was done to find the footage that was used in the film. I think what's unique about this film is that there's a lot of primary sources <laughs> that are used. Uh, you don't usually see that in documentary films. So, you know, I see this film living on because of that. Uh, you know, my background is as an educator. I think, I think educators are natural activists. So I'm an educator slash activist. But as an educator and a teacher, when I saw that, I could see it live on because now I don't have to tell people from Oakland, California, that the Black Panther Party actually started in Lowndes County. That's exactly what I think will, uh, for a lot of people, this film, I think, clearly explains the connection between, and the connection between the Black Power, uh, Black Panther Party, and in California and in other parts of the country, and in Alabama and Lowndes County. And the fact that Lowndes County was the place of origin of the Black Panther Party which was the symbol for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, the political party that the people created there for their political uh, aspirations. Well, thank you all for putting up with my questions. Uh, I want to offer up one last clip uh, before we do audience Q&A. You'll see there are two microphones on either side of this uh, tent. And so after the clip, if you all line up, I know we have a bunch of questions. So we'll do the clip first. We were in charge of our own movement. And if people trying to vote, either was run out, frightened out, or terminated out.
I believe you've heard of Lowndes County. That is an attempt on the part of the white power structure to keep any kind of organization from taking place there and to keep our workers out. But I want you to know that this isn't going to stop us. We are going to Lowndes County in a few minutes. So uh, part of the film is Dr. King is talking about Lowndes County and the situation down there. And it actually comes to the point where they're trying to figure out what King's role should be in Lowndes County. They decide not to go down there, actually, uh, because the situation is a little bit too intense. So that's our entry point for how SNCC makes their way down to Lowndes County. All right, we have one. The question you posed about the shift between language of black freedom and civil rights, and you mentioned civil rights as maybe narrowing the vision. I was curious about a term that I don't think has come up yet, human rights, and whether any of you have found that frame useful in terms of including uh, the environmental justice, education, housing, jobs, uh, alongside civil political rights. Is it a useful term today? Was it um, in earlier eras? And yeah. Well, with the work that I do, we have used the human rights framework. I've actually uh, invited the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty to come to Lyons County and was in Geneva when he made his presentation before the UN Human Rights Council when he talked about what he saw in Lowndes County was something that they generally do not see in developing com in developed communities or the developing world or the developed world that is. And this was um, we've also used and still are using as we talk about water and sanitation issues. We use the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So it is also because we know that at one point uh, there was discussion back in the 60s about going before the UN Human Rights Council to put America on trial because of violation of human rights. So I think it's still a continuity of that work. And we cannot talk about civil rights without talking about human rights. We talk about environmental justice because it does encompass all of that. And if you look at Lyons County today, the benign neglect that is taking place in that community affects all of these things that are described in the Sustainable Development Goals. I had a question about the, the impact of the Voting Rights Act on the county and the recent um, changes to the Voting Rights Act um, after the decision in uh, Shelby County versus Holder and the impact of the most recent gerrymandering of Alabama congressional districts um, and the impact that might have on Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. You're asking about the Voting Rights Act and the effects of Shelby County and then the gerrymandering in Alabama. Well, the Voting Rights Act uh, of 1965 was critical. Uh, it doesn't start the movement. People had already uh, begun to move in places like Lowndes County, Alabama. Uh, but there's, there's, there's two aspects of the Voting Rights Act that are so critical. So once the Voting Rights Act is passed, uh, many white northerners who were supportive of it now look to black folk in the South and they're like, so we good? Like, y'all Negroes need anything else? Right? Like, this is it. Right? We're done. And, and this is where SNCC comes in, they're like, no. You know, what does it profit a man or a woman to have a vote and not be able to control it, right? So we should think of the voting rights not as the end of the civil rights movement, but really as the beginning of another phase that ushers in this effort to give meaning to the vote, and this is where black power comes into play so critically. But of course, one of the critical aspects of what the Voting Rights Act does is it requires preclearance, federal oversight to make sure that counties like, like Lowndes County, states like Alabama that have a history of discrimination don't continue to do those things. And when that's gutted in 2013 by Shelby versus Holder, that really opens the floodgates for all of the foolishness that we have seen since. And it's critically important to, to realize that before controlling communities like Lowndes County was about complete exclusion of people of color of African Americans, right? You don't need to do that anymore. You don't need 100% exclusion if you're doing things like gerrymandering and, and packing districts and cracking other districts and the like. So voter suppression uh, has supplanted that. 
You just need to make it more difficult for a handful of people to discourage a handful of people, to come up with stuff like voter identification as though there's a voter fraud, voter impersonation problem in America. We ain't got a voter impersonation problem. Americans don't vote. So would you, who's, nobody's rushing to the poll trying to vote four or five times. It ain't happening. A couple Republicans. But I mean, other than that, <laughs> ain't really happening. So there's a direct line. One, this wasn't just about access to the ballot. It was about what you do once you have access. And we're still wrestling with these issues today. So it's as relevant today as it was 50, 60 years ago. Now, I'm sorry to the other folks who are lined up. Uh, we, we've got to close now, but I'm hoping we can have a little bit of time to chat at the let out over here. Uh, Jennifer, Hassan, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us here today as we discuss this film, Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power. Again, the film will stream on Peacock in early 2023. And if you haven't already, please go check out the uh, digital, the exclusive digital screener that's in your inbox. Thank you all, and thank you. Thank you very much.